Thank you all for coming. We're uh, delighted to have you here. My name is John Hamry. I'm the president at CSS. Just wanted to say a uh, word of welcome. I usually try to horn in on every successful conference we have. It makes me look better. Uh, and I'm really delighted that we can have you here today. And of course, this is a continuation of a series that I think this is the fifth or sixth time that we've had, uh, we've had the opportunity to hear hear from uh, the, uh, the World uh, Energy Outlook. I mean, it's become kind of a feature in Washington. It's uh, and very important, uh, you know, because, you know, Washington is a place that it'll debate anything, but it, and it doesn't need many facts, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so it's always helpful when we can put facts into the middle of a debate. And, uh, you know, actually, I think this is really the, uh, the, what the International Energy Agency does for all of us. It gives us all an honest grounding on where we can talk about these matters. And I think it's, a, it's such an important service that they render to the global community and to us. And for those reasons that we've, uh, we've treasured and valued the opportunity to work with them. And I especially want to say words of welcome and thanks to Tanaka-san, who has been leading so ably these years. Uh, and uh, we're very fortunate to have him in this position. And uh, uh, although I do resent the fact every time he comes, he poaches yet one more of my staff. And I've, uh, <laughs> so the agreement this time was no more poaching. You can't have him. We need him here. Uh, but, <laughs> but we are delighted to, to welcome him here. We welcome all of you to this. This is a very important discussion. We're the front end of uh, probably another uh, 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 debate in, in the United States on energy policy. It hasn't been working out that well because we keep getting distracted. And uh, so I think we're hoping that we can make this, again, the starting point for the kind of serious, reasoned discussion that we need to have. And uh, this report is an enormously important contribution. I think that there's a very important new work in this section on subsidies, which is an uh, important contribution. When you think about the distortion that is coming in into energy markets globally, uh, thankfully, we've got, again, a good, solid, dispassionate basis where we can talk about it. And I, I, I welcome that, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, Guy Caruso is going to do the real work. As I said, I've gotten all the credit I'm going to get out of this, and if I stay, stand here one more minute, I'm going to run out of my knowledge and show how unprepared I am to lead this discussion. So I'm going to turn it to Guy Caruso. Guy is, is a senior ex uh, fellow with us here at CSIS. Very fortunate. He was, of course, uh, assistant secretary at the Energy Department, where he was kind of the counterpart and, and was providing. So it's this. It's fitting that you would do this, Guy. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. We're delighted you're here. Thank, thank you, John, very much, and uh, it's, it's a great honor to uh, work uh, for such a thoughtful and uh, insightful leader as John Hamry. And, and, uh, <laughs> only one, one uh, very infrequently have to say anything that might be construed as disagreeing with John, but. The one thing one of my successors at the EIA said was there are no facts about the future. And I think, you know, the outlook that we'll hear from uh, the IEA leadership today on sets a baseline from which to think about the future. But as I think all of the IEA uh, presenters will mention, it's mainly designed to uh, provoke our thinking about policy and potential policy changes, whether it has to do with uh, economic efficiency, environment, or energy security. And I think that comes up through very clearly in this report. And we're very honored and pleased to once again collaborate with our uh, friends uh, in the IEA, the senior leadership of, of which we will have with us today. And I think this year is particularly uh, complex and challenging to think about where we're headed over the next 20 to 25 years, as the World Energy Outlook does, partly because we're coming out of such a horrendous global economic downturn, and we really don't know what the next 
years will bring in that respect. Secondly, compounded by the financial difficulties, the global financial system going through uh, continued turmoil, and that has such an important impact on energy investment, which is a big part of the story that uh, we'll hear today, including the subsidies that John mentioned. Uh, the IEA has been at the forefront of uh, some of the work that's being done uh, through the G8 and G20, particularly on the subsidies for G20, and uh, also on the environmental issues, uh, both in the Copenhagen meeting and the Cancun meetings that are going on right now. IEA plays an important role. And something like the World Energy Outlook does provide an analytical framework to, to think about these and, and other things related to both uh, environment and energy security. Um, you know, one of the critical strengths of the IEA is its ability to adapt. Uh, one of our colleagues here at the uh, Energy National Security Program, uh, led by Frank Verastro, uh, Bob Ebel, w was one of the first uh, authors of what, what's now become the World Energy Outlook when it was IEA didn't even exist. And that, at that time, the uh, OECD and IEA countries represented about two thirds of world energy. As we look at this 2010 outlook, we're now looking at uh, IEA membership that's less than 50% of world energy and declining, as the report says. So IEA has had to adapt, and they've done so, I think, remarkably well, and under the leadership of Tanaka-san and his predecessors, more and more is being done that brings in non-OECD uh, members into the work of the IEA, and I think that's obviously a critical, important, critically important part of this outlook. And uh, I won't go go into more depth because uh, I will leave plenty of time for our presenters. Uh, you have their biographies in more detail, so I won't go into great depth. But in order of of uh, presenters uh, this morning. First, we're going to have Executive Director Nobuo Tanaka, who has been, uh, as John said, leading the IEA now for uh, more than three years, coming in September of 07. Uh, prior to that, he had a senior leadership position in the OECD, and then, and then as uh, well with the Japanese government in uh, Ministry of uh, Economics, uh, Trade, and Industry for many years. He has uh, tirelessly, tirelessly been devoted to getting this word out uh, ever since the f arriving at the IEA. It keeps him on the road all the time, as, uh, as, as I know uh, it's very difficult. And then after uh, Director Tanaka, Fatih Biro, the chief economist of the IEA, will uh, go into a bit more, drill down a bit more depth into this report. Uh, Fatih has been with the IEA since 1995 and uh, is the chief economist. Prior to coming to the IEA, he was with OPEC in Vienna and uh, spent a number of years uh, teaching at the University of uh, Vienna and uh, has now become one of the most influential people when it comes to econ energy economics around the world. And then the third speaker will be Ambassador Richard Jones, who's Deputy Executive Director of the IEA. Uh, we're about, it's been about a year and a half now, Dick? Over two. So over two years, time's <laughs> flying. Uh, Dick has had a distinguished career in the U.S. Foreign Service, having served as ambassador to four different countries, uh, U.S. Ambassador to Israel, Kazakhstan, uh, Lebanon, and Kuwait. So he's had deep interactions in the energy part of uh, the geopolitics of this story and, uh, and is extremely well placed to uh, wrap up this session and give us some uh, takeaways. And then we'll, we'll follow that with uh, Q's and A's. And uh, there's such a distinguished and experienced audience here. I know they'll be uh, 
they'll be uh, as challenging as it was to put the, the wheel together, the question. So just one housekeeping word, if you just, if you could turn off your s cell phones or t turn them to, uh, to silent, that would be really appreciated. So without uh, further ado, let me uh, ask uh, Executive Director Tanaka to uh, provide a uh, overview of this year's World Energy Outlook and once again thank him and his team for not only the WEO work but the work you do uh, all year long to inform this uh, extremely uh, uh, challenging energy debate. Nabul, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, uh, Guy. Um, and thank you, Dr. Hamri, for a very nice, kind word. I really appreciate it. Um, well, I, I, if uh, I lose a job in IEA, I'm delighted to come back to Washington to work for CSIS. Much better pay, I guess. Uh, well, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Uh, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, today for this World Energy Outlook 2010. Uh, just I will make a short, uh, brief introduction before I will pass the floor to uh, Dick uh, Fati, uh, our chief economist, who did all the good works behind the scene and also in front of everybody of this World Energy Outlook. I talked with uh, David Pamphrey and Frank Barrester about uh, why this World Energy Outlook this year is so popular. That is true. Here we have more than 300 people. In Japan, we had 400 people. In Beijing, quite a number of people. Everywhere, this World Energy Outlook 2010 is really popular. And we concluded that maybe the uncertainty around the world on the energy sphere is so big that everybody wants to know what will happen in the future. Probably that is very, let's say, convincing argument why this World Energy Outlook is, is such a very, let's say, att attract lots of attention and interest from people. Yes, we know the global recession is, is now coming, uh, let's say, be recovered. Recovery stage is happening. The, the government is putting the economic stimuluses, and, but also the sustainability challenge is still there. And uh, notable steps forward have been taken in the past 12 months by the different, I mean, all the governments, economic recovery front, and also in the Copenhagen, the pledges the, for the climate uh, conference in the last year certainly made a difference. Uh, the expectation was too high in the Copenhagen, so uh, some disappointment happens, but we, are, we calculated that uh, the pledges, if it is in, installed quickly, it covers about 70% of the necessary CO2 reduction toward 2020. So it's a, it's a good, uh, let's say, start. But further uh, implementation of the policies uh, of uh, uh, development, deployment of this uh, secure low carbon technologies is, 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 is the issue. How can we really achieve this? Because still it's not binding. G20 commitments for example, in, in to reform wasteful and insufficient fossil fuel subsidies, which Mr. Hamre as well as Guy touched upon. And in this uh, uh, issue, the G in the G20 group, the United States is leading in this exercise. I had a very good chat, just I show you for, I, 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 I had a good chat with your president <laughs> in Yokohama, in the APEC meeting about subsidy. He really appreciate our work and our contribution to the process. I really appreciate, I really thank him for using us in that sense. And uh, these policies definitely could make a difference, but still it's not binding. And with what level of ambition and commitment will they be pursued? And how far can they take us toward a sustainable energy future? Our latest World Energy Outlook wrestles with these questions. And we have departed from the practice of building projections only on the measures <laughs> that governments have already taken. We call it reference scenario, the current policy scenario in this world energy. 
the focal point of our presentation is now the new policy scenario, which takes account of uh, broad policy commitments and plans, even in the absence of the clear pathway for implementation. That is one big difference uh, from the uh, previous World Energy Outlooks. The report assesses what it could, would take to reach the 450 ppm stabilization scenario. In the aftermath of Copenhagen COP15, well, we still, this is still achievable, still doable, but the 450 scenario is now very, very, and very difficult to achieve. And globally, we find that it will require even more, much more aggressive emission reductions post-2020 and will we'll cost at least an additional one trillion US dollars compared with our last estimate in the World Energy Outlook 2009. Expanding renewable energy supply remains indispensable in efforts to improve our energy security and combat climate change. Our timely analysis of the prospect of renewables explores the critical role of government support in improving their cost competitiveness and stimulating further technological advances. But it costs us 300 billion US dollars in 2030 to achieve this 450 ppm scenario. Through several unique studies, Wales seeks to deepen our understanding of the trends that will shape our common energy security. The report includes a comprehensive survey of energy in the Caspian region where domestic energy policies and market trend bear strong influence on its potential for exports and to diversify global oil and gas supply. But whether these gas or oil goes to east or west from Caspian is a very interesting question. We ask the question, will peak oil, will peak oil be a guest or a specter at the feast? The global oil production will surely peak one day, but it may not be only a consequence of resource constraints. Factors affecting both supply and demand, including government policies, will determine that peak. So 450 scenario gives you a very interesting answer for this question. Even beyond security of oil and gas supply for several billion people, Energy security is simply about having access to the most basic of modern energy services, electricity and clean cooking facilities. We know US uh, Secretary of State, uh, Madame Clinton, takes the good initiative of these clean cooking facilities. We set out what it would take to end global energy poverty by 2030. The cost is 30 billion US dollars a year. Not a big deal compared to the other uh, amounts of investment. Significant changes are also taking place in energy sector, and this World Energy Outlook is very rich in new data and analysis to describe them. We see a number of possible game changers for the global energy market, including, for example, China. In our analysis, China is the largest energy consumer in 2009. And Chinese decision, and especially government decision in energy in each of the energy sector will make a big impact globally. Another game changer is natural gas. The shale gas revolution that has been underway in the United States has certainly serves as a very important impetus for the global market. And uh, our World Energy Outlook team is going to develop a high gas usage or high gas utilization scenario to investigate the impact of stronger than expected gas supply and demand. And this report will be released middle of next year, in May, June next year. Well, to elaborate I, the key findings and message in this year's World Energy Outlook, I will now turn the floor to the Fatih, the chief economist. But I really thank all of you to come.
even in a very busy time, um, to listen to us. Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Tanaka and uh, Guy, for the introduction. Just a couple of words before. <clears throat> uh, this book is, I mean, it has been peer reviewed, about 200 people, experts uh, in the world, depending on their uh, expertise, uh, which is extremely useful for us. And I should mention that the uh, Guy Caruso, the Frank Verastro uh, uh, over there, uh, Echo, Adam Szymanski, a couple of the colleagues uh, who were, uh, who are here with us helped us a lot to put the uh, ideas together and give us very good uh, uh, comments. Also, I see colleagues from the EIA here. Just to mention to you that the uh, EIA's international energy outlook and the annual energy outlook for U.S. is very helpful for us, very inspirational to understand the U.S. and the, uh, the international energy markets. And one final thanks to uh, 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 Frank Verastro here. It is very difficult to find young, very good uh, energy experts uh, to work in Paris. So they don't want to come to Paris. And uh, I am very uh, thankful to uh, Frank and also uh, Guy Caruso to have uh, uh, given me the opportunity to work together with uh, Matt Frank, who is outside, I think, trying to uh, put the things uh, together. Thank you very much for the uh, CSIS, that very nice uh, present. Okay. <laughs> Frank is just coming, entering the room now. You can all look at him. So, uh, uh, who just got married uh, last week, if I found out wrong. So, okay. Let me go to uh, a bit of uh, uncertainties. Now, Mr. Tanaka mentioned that there are uncertainties around the uh, energy world, and many of you know much better than us that this energy world is always surrounded with uh, uncertainties. But what we think, or what our numbers show us, that the uncertainties we are surrounded now are, uh, both in terms of their depth and in terms of their numbers, are uh, unprecedented. I would like to uh, share with you at least five of them that I think are uh, crucial today. The first one, everybody knows, it is the economy. How the economy will evolve in the next years to come, especially the recovery, especially in the OECD countries, and especially in uh, Europe and elsewhere. Uh, economy is the main driver of the uh, demand, supply, investments for financing, and there are uh, significant questions about the, uh, the, uh, the economic growth, and this is a major uncertainty. The second one, a trend that uh, worries us a lot. When we look at the oil demand and the supply picture, they are becoming less and less sensitive to the changes in the international oil prices. The effect of the international oil price on the uh, demand, creating a response, and also bringing new oil to the markets is a bit less pronounced than in, in the past, than which may uh, mean that we may see higher prices in the future than we did in the past, and how high these prices will be, and what kind of responses will come from the governments to those high prices is another uncertainty. Third, uh, gas markets. Uh, last year, when we had the honor to uh, present the World Energy Outlook here, which was focused on the natural gas markets, we came up with a, a, a conclusion that the a gas glut is coming. So it is now with us, and uh, the how strong the penetration of gas will be is a question mark. Another one is that if it is very strong, what will be the implications of the uh, that uh, strong gas penetration on the other fuels, not only for gas, other fuels, plus the uh, uh, existing gas pricing uh, regimes, and also on the uh, climate front. What will be the implications of that? This is again an, another uncertainty. The fourth one is on climate change. Uh, again, last year, we said that we would uh, hope to see an agreement in, in Copenhagen, which would 
give a signal to the energy sector so that energy sector can uh, transform itself in order to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions. However, we did not see a legally binding agreement. After Copenhagen, more than 100 countries put some targets, pledges submitted to the United Nations, but they are not legally binding. So if, it, if they don't, the countries don't, do not fulfill those targets, uh, nobody can uh, uh, hold them uh, responsible. So now the question is, how important the climate will be in the next years, in the government's agenda, and what kind of policies they will take, which would have implications for the energy sector? Climate and energy nexus, it is now a, a rather an uncertainty. The fifth one is, for me, the most, uh, perhaps the uh, biggest uncertainty is China and other emerging countries. What kind of policies they are going to follow is of crucial importance. As you will see in a minute, the charts we are going to show you, decisions which will be taken in Beijing for the Chinese energy sector will have overwhelming implications for the international energy markets, for all of us. And the, not only for the producers, but also consumers, for all of us, for the industry, and uh, what kind of policies they are going to follow will be therefore of crucial importance. And there are many question marks about uh, those policies. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> let's start with the, uh, how the global energy picture would look like with the, uh, in the next 25 years. OECD countries, namely the countries of the US, Canada, uh, Europe, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and Korea put together, their energy demand will be more or less stable in aggregate terms. The growth comes from outside of the uh, OECD. For me, there are five countries which are the drivers of the global energy demand growth, namely China, 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 <laughs> India, and Middle East. These are the, in the order of magnitude is this way. So this is three times the China, one time the India, and one time the Middle East. They are the drivers. The rest is also important, but uh, uh, less, uh, less important. But having said that, we should be fair uh, with uh, those countries. Today, a Chinese person consumes only one third of the energy that an OECD person consumes. And 25 years of time, when China becomes even uh, much bigger than now, an energy consumer, still a Chinese person would be consuming only two-thirds of the energy compared to an uh, OECD person. So from one-third to two-thirds, and which huge growth in China in volum volumetric terms and with major implications. When we look at the fuel-by-fuel -fuel basis, we see that the uh, in terms of coal and oil, we do not expect the OECD countries' consumption as a group. We see that uh, the levels we, uh, we were observing in 2007, 2008 uh, again. That will be a, rather a saturation. But we see that the gas is growing in all the countries, and gas is the only fossil fuels growth in the OECD countries, and bulk of the growth in all fuels come China and rest of the emerging uh, countries. So again, uh, highlighting this issue. Now, why the growth is coming from there? There are at least uh, three reasons. I should say two plus one. The one is economy is growing, and growing economy needs energy, and energy is uh, unlike some of us think, is a very good thing, in fact. It makes the life uh, easier, more convenient, uh, uh, more comfortable, and uh, it increases the productivity. So it is those countries with the growing uh, economies, they need uh, energy. Second, population. More people, more energy. Population growth is very strong in those countries. These are all good and well-justified reasons why the bulk of the growth and in fact, almost all the growth comes from the developing countries. But, but, there is another reason which is not well justified and which is not a, 
a good one, namely, uh, as was mentioned by um, uh, Mr. Tanaka, uh, subsidies. There are substantial fossil fuel subsidies in many emerging countries. And these subsidies lead to wasteful use of energy. If something is cheap, below it is a uh, real value, we tend to use this without uh, paying too much attention how, how much we use of that. So uh, currently, we think the subsidies are about uh, 300 billion US uh, dollar fossil fuel subsidies in the year 2009, where we had the low oil prices. And uh, we expect subsidies in 2015 to reach about 600 billion US dollar if the governments do not change their policies. And this is a huge amount of money. And it is a burden for many countries as well who are subsidizing. For example, Iran, according to our analysis, uh, uses about one third of the government budget to cover the subsidies, where you have the uh, gasoline price about eight cents per, uh, uh, per, per liter. So very, very uh, low, even lower than the uh, United States. So if you uh, look at the uh, oil exporting countries and uh, their situation, some of them are facing major challenges, which is the following. Since the domestic demand goes very strong, the availability of export is shrinking and pushing countries to make investments in order to keep the same export uh, uh, levels. In fact, in many of many, many countries, if they were to, if they were to phase out the subsidies, their export availability will go up substantially, and they would be able to export a lot of uh, oil, gas, and cash a lot of uh, uh, hard currency. So this is one of the issues, and uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Tanaka mentioned, we made, together with other international organizations, a report to G20 Summit uh, in Seoul, and uh, we were happy to see that the community of the G20 uh, refer to the uh, uh, addressing the uh, fossil fuel subsidies uh, issue. Now, moving to uh, oil uh, markets uh, slowly. One structural change in the oil markets we see that almost all the growth in global oil demand is coming from the transportation sector. Cars, trucks, and, and jets. And this is rather an important trend, we think, uh, to identify, because in the transportation sector, even though the prices go up, we do not have readily available alternatives to oil for the time being. It's a bit of a captive uh, 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 demand. Unlike the, for example, electricity uh, uh, generation, we use a lot of oil in electricity generation in the past, but when the prices went up, we were able to move from oil to uh, nuclear power or coal or renewables or, or gas. We were using a lot of oil in uh, heating. I don't know yes, but in my uh, home country, in, in Turkey, we were using a lot of fuel oil. And when the prices went up, we switched to uh, natural uh, gas, electricity, and the other things. But in case of transportation, our uh, maneuver room is rather uh, uh, limited. So, uh, and on top of that, bulk of the, uh, this growth in the transportation comes from uh, developing uh, countries in which prices are, as I said, heavily subsidized. So there is not a... Uh, 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 direct effect on the consumers to change their uh, behavior. And here again, China is the driver of the transportation uh, sector. And this is again very well justified. According to our statistics, today in the United States, more than 700 people out of 1,000 uh, people own a car. In Europe, about 500 people out of 1,000 own a car, and in China it is 30 person, 30 person out of 1,000 person on a car. And in 2035, when China becomes a oil 
consuming giant. And many people think that our oil demand numbers for China is rather modest. But again, if China becomes a, a big oil giant, still Chinese car ownership level will be about 240 person out of 1,000 person. It means more or less one third of the United States of today when China becomes this giant. So it may well be the case, it is very uh, uh, likely that the Chinese car ownership can even uh, increase stronger than uh, what we have in our uh, calculations, which may well mean that the, the demand will be even uh, higher. So the oil demand will be strong, mainly driven by transportation sector and the uh, developing countries led by China. What about the production uh, side? We think that the uh, in many non-OPEC fields, we see a strong uh, decline in uh, North Sea, in United States uh, and elsewhere. But uh, we expect that the crude oil production will be about 68, 69 million barrels per a plateau. And most of the oil will need to come from the uh, members of OPEC. However, there is one issue here. According to our projections, we have to about 30 million barrels per day in, in the year 2035, between now and 2035, about 30 million barrels per day develop the fields which are already discovered, and about 16 million barrels per day we have to uh, discover the fields. So it's a huge task. And to discover the fields, you have to make exploration activity especially in the countries where the resources are, namely the Middle East, and you can only discover something, you can only find something if you look for. So if you don't look for, uh, you cannot find it, and sometimes even if you look for, you cannot find it, but to find it is, you have to look for it, that, that it, it means a lot of uh, exploration activity needs to take place in those countries. We expect the NGL, natural gas liquids, a type of a byproduct by, uh, when producing a uh, uh, gas, uh, it is going to increase in the, in the uh, future from uh, Middle East countries, but also from uh, Russia, United States, and elsewhere. And also oil sands will play a growingly important uh, role, especially uh, oil sands from uh, uh, Canada. When we look at the country by country basis, uh, these are the countries uh, for the uh, growth of the oil production will come from. Most of them are, again, OPEC uh, countries, and OPEC's market share will increase substantially. Uh, we think about over 50%, a level that we have only seen once before the first uh, oil price shock. And uh, Saudi Arabia and Iraq are uh, very important in terms of the leading the growth. Iraq is, uh, according to our uh, analysis, is crucial. Uh, if we do not if we are not able to get the production growth in, uh, in Iraq to, uh, from 2.5 today, we expect to come around uh, 7 million barrels per day in the next 25 years of time. If we don't see that production growth uh, coming, we may well have difficulties balanced uh, markets in a way that we would like to see. So perhaps if I can look at all the countries, most crucial one is that we have to have a success story in Iraq, and we all know that there are some challenges to get that uh, production growth uh, happening. And just for the uh, sake of the records, our expectation of uh, growth uh, from Iraq is much, much modest than the government's official expectations, both in terms of the uh, timing and in terms of the levels. Brazil and uh, Kazakhstan, uh, especially Brazil, the Offshore, we expect a strong growth from Brazil. Kazakhstan, I will come in a, a minute in a detail. But again, Canadian oil sands will be also very important to balance the markets and helping and addressing the energy security situation. Couple of words about gas. So, <clears throat> uh, we think that the gas demand will grow uh, strongly and the main drivers will be, in terms of volumes, 
edition volumes will come from China and Middle East. Especially in China, it is, uh, we expect that the Chinese consumption around 2020 may be uh, coming close to 250 BCM, a very strong growth. And we do not, and I want to underline, we do not exclude the uh, uh, possibility that the China gas growth may be a similar growth that we have seen a few years ago in the oil markets. This is especially in the coastal uh, region where the bulk of the industry and economy and the growth uh, take place. And it is getting more and more difficult and costly to bring the uh, coal from Inner Mongolia or uh, uh, Western China to bring to the, uh, uh, the coastal region, especially when you compare, which we did, with the gas uh, coming from uh, uh, countries in that very region, including uh, Australia. And Middle East, we expect more and more uh, uh, combined cycle gas turbines in, in Middle East, both for electricity and also in the context of uh, desalination, uh, more gas uh, to be used and also for the petrochemicals. Unconventional gas, uh, uh, we expect about one third of the growth in the pot, uh, total gas production to come from unconventional gas, in addition to uh, US and Canada. Uh, China, Australia are uh, key candidates, and not only in shale gas, but also in terms of coal bed uh, uh, methane. So last year, when we were here, as I said, we predicted a gas glut uh, to come, which is now with us uh, uh, today. And now we think that this gas glut, or oversupply of gas in, in global terms, can be with us uh, for a few years about uh, 10 years. The size of the glut may be not as thick as now we have, but we think about uh, two times the normal levels, about 150 BCM, 2020 to see a gas uh, surplus may not be surprising. What could change this game? Uh, it could be many things, but one of them would be a stronger than expected economic recovery in key regions, uh, such as in, in, in Europe, as uh, gas uh, uh, consumers. But this oversupply of gas, um, lots of and rather uh, cheap gas, has major implications. Some of them are good, some of them are uh, perhaps unintendedly negative for some uh, others, uh, but everybody will be affected from the strong penetration of uh, gas. The first one is we already see, we already saw, namely, Especially in Europe, many of the long-term gas contracts are indexed to uh, uh, oil prices. And with the increasing uh, oil prices, uh, the uh, gas prices in long-term contracts are increasing. And on the other hand, you have a lot of uh, cheap gas as LNG looking for uh, buyers in the markets. And there is a growing uh, divorce or at least a separation between these two uh, gas prices. And what we have seen last year in Europe and we have been, uh, we were already predicting this, and we mentioned this before, that the, even in the existing long-term contracts, uh, at least three countries in Europe were able to get some improvements in the existing long-term contracts, which is a big thing with, with a major gas exporter to Europe. Second, perhaps it is more importantly, we are seeing the, the signs of new long-term gas contracts to be uh, made on a more creative way, reflecting the markets rather than only indexing to oil. And one shouldn't be surprised, and this could be our prediction for uh, 2011, uh, perhaps because 2010 we said uh, there will be a gas glut, and 2011 our prediction could be, we may see a new regime for the long-term gas contracts where we see more and more elements of uh, market uh, included. Implications of uh, strong gas uh, uh, use is, uh, of course, good for uh, gas, but gas, there is a, in the energy mix, we have 100%, and the, if the share of something goes up, the share of others uh, will need to go down, so there is no other uh, way around. So uh, what we see, is in many countries, especially renewables, 
are in difficulty because of the cheap gas prices. Uh, for the next power plant to be built, there is a, a very typical uh, competition between the CCGT and between a, a wind turbine. And the cheap and available gas, lots of gas in many countries, as uh, Mr. Tanaka mentioned, we are uh, visiting many countries and talk with the uh, governments and industry, there is a, a strong uh, uh, competition. And I will come in the renewables more on that. The same happens to, uh, in some countries for coal. We see a replacement of uh, a coal by gas. And of course, in the United States, uh, most of the colleagues know much better than me here, there will be a, a series of retirements of the coal-fired power plants uh, soon, uh, according to our estimations, about 190 gigawatts in the next 25 years. And uh, gas may be a very good candidate to be a, a, a replacement uh, for that. But also, some new technologies, such as the carbon capture and storage for coal, there may be, in fact, to be uh, more uh, to the point, there is a loss of appetite for CCS uh, for coal as the gas becomes cheaper and available. If the trend continues, uh, we may see a, a, a more and more challenges CCS for coal to be a part of the uh, uh, game and to come to the market uh, uh, sooner rather than uh, later. Now, talking about coal, coal, despite everything, remains the backbone of electricity generation. In OECD countries, it's going down. In, uh, in non-OECD countries, especially in India, we expect a growth, but the main growth comes from China. It's about 600 gigawatts, which is equal to the current coal capacity of US, all European countries plus Japan put together. So this is uh, tremendous. And this is, again, this is uh, our numbers may be on the uh, moderate uh, side uh, here. And you may, I don't know if there are colleagues who follow the coal markets here, if you look at the coal prices recently, we see an increase in the coal prices, and there are a few reasons, but most important one being China uh, importing uh, coal. And China today imports only 2.8% of its coal use, only 2.8%. So it's a very uh, small portion, but big for the uh, international markets, and we expect China remain to be a coal importer at least uh, for the next uh, few years uh, uh, to come. Uh, one other implication for this, uh, the growth of uh, coal plants in, in China, is uh, only the CO2 emissions coming from Chinese coal plants, I must say from China total, only the Chinese coal power plant CO2 emissions are about 30% of the total world CO2 emissions of everything. So this is just to put in a context how important the Chinese uh, electricity sector is for the climate change uh, debate, of course, uh, as well as other uh, uh, countries. Renewable energies, <coughs> we think renewables, uh, uh, both in terms of electricity generation and, and biofuels, are entering the uh, mainstream. They are uh, becoming more and more important, mainly uh, due to the uh, government policies to address the climate change and energy security uh, problems. Because renewables are, in, uh, in theory, they are very good to address both of these challenges in front of us. But the problem is they need substantial support. Without that support, uh, financial support, they will not be able to uh, grow as uh, much as the governments or the many, uh, many of us uh, would like to uh, see. And we have also calculated renewable uh, subsidies worldwide. It's about 57 billion US dollar today, and it will grow uh, in the future. This is, of course, as I said, a, a key discussion in many countries now, renewable uh, subsidies especially given the context we are in, two, two elements. One, 
many countries have difficulties in terms of their budget deficits. And there is a growing discussions between the finance ministers and uh, energy and environmental ministers, what to do with those subsidies. Second, as I said in a, a minute ago, uh, the cheap gas, lower gas prices, make the life also difficult for uh, renewable, uh, justify the renewable subsidies given the gas uh, rather uh, uh, positive environmental performance. Uh, in many countries, including the United States, we see the renewable energy investments uh, not in a good shape. Our uh, analysis is that the, the renewable energy investments in the United States in 2010 will be about uh, minus 50% lower than in the year 2009. And uh, there are many factors there, but uh, uh, these two I mentioned to you are also uh, there. In terms of the uh, uh, when we look at the countries, uh, companies in Europe, many renewable companies, uh, their share prices are not uh, the brightest in the last quarter uh, we saw. So uh, renewable energies uh, will go through difficult uh, times, and especially when the economy is weak and the, uh, the, uh, the competitors are uh, cheap, uh, if the governments are serious about the sh uh, having a substantial share of uh, renewable energies, they have to... Uh, make up their mind how they go with those uh, uh, subsidy uh, regimes. Now, one point on another point on China. Up to now, uh, I told you China's uh, likely implications on the commodity markets, oil, uh, gas, and coal, putting a pressure in a justified manner, putting a pressure in the, in the markets. Uh, but there is a, another side of the coin. Namely, when we look at the clean energy technology investments or growth in terms of capacity in the next uh, 25 years or so, we see that the bulk of it is going to take place in China in terms of solar, wind, nuclear power, even in the context of advanced uh, car technologies. And this is, in fact, a good news for, uh, for us because the, the issue is China, by doing a lot of or building a lot of uh, new capacity there, will be able to bring the cost of those new technologies down. There's a thing called uh, learning by doing. The more you do the new technologies, the more you bring the prices uh, down, even though the, the, the trend uh, may not be so steep. So this is a good news, making them uh, uh, lower than today. The costs, it's a good service for uh, many uh, of us, for the rest of the world. But there is other part of the uh, issue, namely, uh, for example, in the car technology, if China becomes, as we say here, the leader of the advanced car technologies, the champion of it, then what happens with the current champions? So uh, in terms of, uh, we know that the car industry, car manufacturing is one of the crucial uh, elements of the OECD countries' economy today, if, and it is about 3% of the GDP comes from car manufacturing, what will be the implications of that uh, on the OECD countries, the China's growth in that uh, demand in that respect, is uh, something uh, to be seen, what will be the implications in terms of economy, trade, and the others, uh, I think, an important element. Now, let me move very briefly to the Caspian region, which we look uh, very carefully. I will go very quickly. This. Uh, even though it's a very important region, we look at country by country, especially four of them, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan. We see that the Kazakhstan will play a crucial role in terms of total uh, oil production increase. Uh, about uh, They make up around five uh, million barrels per day, especially due to uh, the spare giant fields in uh, Kazakhstan. And in terms of uh, gas, in terms of gas, the uh, production from the uh, region, thanks to uh, Turkmenistan mainly, can come about 300 uh, uh, BCM. For those who know Europe, for, uh, Norway is very important for the European gas picture. Uh, this means uh, three times to Europe, three times to Norway. 300 BCM means three times new Norway coming to the uh, gas uh, uh, picture. I say three times to Norway, uh, but it is uh, in Europe we discussed since 20 years 
how to bring that gas to, uh, to Europe, almost 20 years, two decades, uh, uh, route A or B or C or D, and the different uh, philosophical and economical uh, discussions we have. And China, only three and a half years ago, started to discuss with Turkmenistan for a gas pipeline, and uh, the discussion started financing pipeline late, and today the gas is flowing to uh, uh, China, the Turkmen gas. So uh, just to say to our European colleagues, and we say also this the same thing to you in Europe as well, not only in the United States, that the, the, there may be a competitor for the uh, uh, slowly but surely to the uh, Caspian and Russian gas and oil vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, Europe, it is not to be uh, underestimated. Uh, Another point, perhaps before finishing the uh, Caspian part here, is uh, very important, at least we think so, because we look at the domestic markets there. The efficiency is terrible, the eff efficiency levels. If the, those countries would bring their efficiency levels to the level of uh, OECD countries, they would cut half of the, their domestic demand, which could be a very good news for exporting uh, that uh, energy outside. So let me finish uh, this part and briefly talk a bit on uh, climate change. <clears throat> we thought it was timely why we have the uh, discussions in Cancun uh, uh, going on uh, and, uh, uh, this week and uh, uh, we thought it is important to uh, bring you some uh, facts that we thought uh, uh, important to consider. The picture, the energy picture I show you up to now, oil, gas, coal, etc., brings us a trajectory which ends up a temperature increase 3.5 degrees Celsius. So according to the scientists, and according to the United Nations and everybody who knows these things a lot, uh, they say it is definitely unacceptable, with huge implications in terms of the sea levels, in terms of availability of water, uh, uh, migration, species, and, and, and so on. It's completely unacceptable. So uh, we looked what needs to be done in order to come from 3.5 degrees, which is unacceptable for, uh, by everybody, to a two degrees, which is considered to be the, uh, the uh, limit uh, to, uh, to hinder major catastrophical implications of uh, climate change. What needs to be done? So we build a scenario which we call 450 scenario, as Mr. Tanaka said. 450 is the number of uh, particulates, carbon particulates in the atmosphere, which makes sure that we remain in the two degrees uh, uh, trajectory. And it assumes the, the, a very strong implementation of the pledges, targets after uh, Copenhagen. Now, I would like to share something with you here, which was a big surprise for me when we were preparing the World Energy Outlook. We look at these pledges made by the countries after the Copenhagen, more than 100 countries. OECD and non-OECD countries, and uh, I am not an environmental uh, economist at all and scientist at all. I look at those pledges one by one. I was very much surprised because some of the pledges are extremely, extremely vague. For example, one country says, a very big country with lots of emissions, it says, I am going to reduce my emissions in 2020 X percent compared to my business as usual case. But you don't know what is the business as usual case. It is, it is, there is no hint about it. And they can change the business as case every year, or what is the assumption? It's, some other countries say, I am going to reduce my emissions in 2020 between X percent and Y percent. And the difference between X and Y is so big that it doesn't have any sense to have any target uh, there. So there is a need for uh, transparency and uh, accountability on those pledges and it doesn't exist today. At least as a, a simple uh, person looking at the, those numbers, I really don't see that they are uh, as credible as they need uh, uh, to be. And we also saw that the, those pledges, even if they were to be implemented, and as I said, they are voluntary and nobody can 
uh, hold them, uh, help them responsible if they don't do it. Since they lack ambition, if we want to come to 450, we need to do after 2020 so major, so huge efforts that the cost of coming to a 450 or a two degrees trajectory increased after Copenhagen by one trillion US dollar, according to our estimations. This is a huge money, but the problem is more than the money. Since the cost is increasing, to have an agreement will be more difficult. Because normally everybody wants to have an agreement. There is nobody who is against the agreement, but the problem is nobody wants to have the responsibility on his or her shoulders, or the minimum responsibility. If the cost goes up, the, the amount of responsibility to be shared will go up, and it will be less likely to have an agreement. And the, uh, the longer we, do, we don't have an agreement, the more costly it will be to find this uh, solution, and the uh, saga continues. I will try to show you how challenging it became now to come to 450. For me, we are only a few inches away to say goodbye to 450 or two degrees, only a few inches away, and I will explain you why. This is the so-called carbon intensity or decarbonization of the energy. It is normally taking place uh, in this space about 1.4% per year. It is improving 1.4% uh, per year. If the most strangest, strangest interpretation of the Copenhagen pledges were to be made, and they were to be fulfilled, as I told, they are voluntary. Nobody uh, knows if they are going to be fulfilled. The, the carbon intensity improvement becomes from 1.4% to 2.8 percent, double. And we have uh, seen only once in our lifetimes that the carbon intensity improved 2.5 percent. It was right after the oil price shock. But it was only one year, and this has to be uh, about uh, uh, 12 years. And the problem is not that. The problem is, after that even, the carbon intensity has to, uh, improvement has to double again about 5.4%. Uh, uh, it means compared to now, we have to see a fourfold increase in the, our efforts. And on top of that, those efforts mostly need to take place where the climate change is not at the top of the agenda of the countries. So this is uh, where we are. But if we were to still go for 450, there are two sectors which are key to implement the changes. One is the electricity generation. We need a much stronger penetration of the uh, nuclear, renewable, uh, and uh, new technologies such as carbon capture and uh, storage. And the second one is a major change in the transportation sector. Transportation sector sometimes escapes from our uh, radar in the climate change debate, but it is not uh, a very innocent one. Today, uh, coal uh, is about 42% uh, of CO2 emissions, and oil is about 38%. So the difference between those two is uh, not uh, huge uh, uh, there. And we need to see, to come to a 450, about uh, 10 out of, four, out, of, out of 4 out of 10 cars, 4 out of 10 cars, about 40% of the new sales of cars in 2035 to comes from advanced car uh, vehicles. I see this transformation compared to electricity generation much harder in terms of technology, but I am a bit more hopeful here because China is behind the electric cars uh, uh, story, at least for the time being in a very solid terms. But the Chinese push for electric cars is not necessarily driven by uh, climate change. It is mainly driven by the uh, slowing down the oil import uh, growth. But it doesn't matter. I mean, it is, as Chinese say, you don't look at the uh, color of the cat if it catches the mouse. So it is, if it helps here, uh, address the oil security and climate change at the same time, it is a, a good thing. And uh, we think if such policies are put in place, the, uh, it can have very good implications for the oil markets as well. 
This is the oil demand uh, in our uh, likely uh, scenario, which grows and, as I said, can lead to higher prices than we have now in the future. But in the case of 450, a transformation in the transportation sector, we may see that the oil demand is much weaker, which, would, which could comfort the markets. And uh, we think it is the only way now that the consuming countries can have a say in the oil markets through trans, uh, transformation in the transportation sector. There is no other way in terms of the, uh, uh, the uh, oil markets. This is the main way to address this issue. Before I give the uh, uh, floor uh, to uh, Ambassador uh, Dick Jones to talk about the policy implications, I wanted to bring to attention one final issue which is not very topical in the energy circles, but it is very topical in our hearts in the IEA. As some of you may know, we look each year about the energy and poor, energy poverty issue. And according to our analysis this year, 1.4 billion people, about 20% of the global population, they have no access to electricity. And this is not only an economic issue, this is a social issue and even a moral issue, uh, we believe. And it is mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa and in, in uh, South Asia, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, these two uh, regions. And what does it mean not to having electricity? It is not only not being able to watch uh, uh, television, but it is, uh, uh, you cannot keep the medication for your child in the refrigerator, uh, for example. The day finishes for them much earlier than, 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 than for us. And there's a big imbalance here. The amount of electricity used by 800 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa, 800 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa, is equal to the electricity used in New York, where you have 18, uh, in New York State, where you have 18 million people. So just showing you the, uh, the imbalances uh, here, and uh, I think it is uh, very important, as we have uh, done, uh, Mr. Tanaka, together with uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, presented this uh, work in the, uh, at the sidelines of the UN uh, annual meeting in, in, in September, and we are going to follow up uh, this uh, work. Now, I would like to now uh, uh, suggest that uh, Ambassador Jones uh, uh, discuss the, uh, the implications of this, uh, these uh, numbers. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've bombarded you with a lot of facts and figures about the analysis from our latest uh, World Energy Outlook this morning. Uh, but what does it really mean? I think if we could leave you with one message this morning, I'll see if I can work this, it would be that uh, today's energy policies, including those pledged in connection with the uh, Copenhagen Accord, but not yet opt adopted, uh, are not nearly sufficient to place the world on a path towards sustainability, whether from a security, economic, or an environmental perspective. And you see here on the screen. But of course, the IA always has more than just one message, so let's see what else we've got here. Uh, we believe the age of cheap energy, and particularly cheap oil, is over. As Fatih mentioned, uh, uh, we're seeing in increasingly insensitive uh, responses to price. It's because everybody knows that the prices are going up. Um, of course, we do recommend that uh, with policy action, we can uh, lower the international price, uh, but then um, we believe that that would allow room for a carbon price of some form, uh, which would keep domestic prices up. Stronger penetration of natural gas can have profound implications for energy markets and the environment. Uh, Fatih mentioned uh, some of the work uh, that I think we'll be doing uh, in, coming, in coming months to see what happens if we look at gas as a, a potential substitute. Uh, but it's, the question is a substitute for what? It could be a substitute for coal, which would be very good, but it could also be a substitute for renewables, which in the long, which may 
make some sense in the short run if, if renewable technology isn't available. But in the long run, gas, although it ha has half the emissions of coal, uh, still has a lot more emissions than renewables. And of course, to get the renewables to enter the mainstream, we need long-term support to boost their competitiveness. And ironically, uh, China's actions, which are for its own self-interest, may be, in fact, the best way that we get the economies of scale needed uh, to um, make renewables competitiveness. And finally, getting the prices right by phasing out fossil fuel uh, subsidies is a crucial measure uh, to cut demand. But if we're going to achieve sustainability for ourselves and future generations, in effect, we need to begin a revolution in the way we produce, transport, and consume energy, and we need to begin it now. The 450 scenario that Fatih's uh, uh, <coughs> laid out briefly is, uh, shows us the way. It's a path. And in fact, uh, it's at least cost approach based on plausible assumptions. The world must eliminate fossil fuel subsidies. We must invest heavily in energy efficiency. And I want to compliment those people who have kept the temperature down in this room. We're not wasting any <laughs> money on heating today. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but we need, al we need also to accelerate the deployment of low-carbon technologies with consistent and transparent policies that are tailored to reflect the different stages of development of, a techno of technologies. Two key low-carbon technology goals are the complete decarbonization of electric power, uh, power generation by the middle of this century and an equally rapid adoption of advanced vehicle technologies, including electric, uh, but also biofuels. Such steps will begin to reduce our dependence on imported energy and help break the traditional link between energy use, economic output, and carbon dioxide emissions. What is the IAEA doing to help spark this revolution? First, like any good watchdog, we bark about what we see. We try to get our message out via a variety of routes, to our governments in official meetings and workshops as well as in bilateral meetings, to the public through publications, press events, and speeches at conferences like this one, to non-member countries via diplomatic engagement, workshops, training and capacity building activities, and other joint activities. But we do more than just preach. We also do. We've trained literally hundreds of statisticians and energy analysts from non-member countries, including China and India. We invite officials from non-member countries to take part in our regular emergency response exercises. We had one just last week in Paris, and they come. We had 34 uh, in the exercise last week from 10 different countries. We also hold special exercises, emergency exercises, just for them. We've done it for Thailand, and we're planning more. We have extensive joint programs with China, India, and Russia. We invite them to our committee meetings, up to and including at the, in, at the ministerial level. So engagement is a very important topic on our agenda. We are now using our data and analysis to draw plans for the low carbon revolution in the form of roadmaps for the de development, demonstration, and commercialization of some 20 advanced technologies between now and 2050. Seven of these roadmaps are already finished. They're on wind, solar PV power, uh, concentrating solar power, electric vehicles, cement industry, carbon capture storage, and nuclear power. They're available free of charge from our webpage. And several more of these studies are now underway. In addition, we are doing work for the G20 on reducing fossil fuel subsidies. You heard, saw some of the, our, the results of our work there. For the UN on alleviating energy poverty in developing countries. Again, you saw some of that. For the Clean Energy Ministerial on research, development, and, de and deployment investment needs on electrical grids, sustainable hydropower, or electric vehicles and to establish clean energy solution centers in several uh, major, economy, uh, major economies. We're also working on cooperative projects with other international organizations or bodies, including the International Energy Forum and the International Partnership for Energy Efficiency Cooperation. Recent outreach activities with non-member countries include a partnership meeting for energy security and sustainability, as well as the creation of an international low-carbon energy technology platform which is intended to accelerate the spread of advanced technologies around the world. I think you get the idea. 
we are extremely busy revolutionaries, even though we wear suits. Of course, nobody knows for sure if such efforts to change current trends will succeed, but let us hope they do. Otherwise, a growing competition for resources could snuff out economic growth and make the world even more dangerous place than it is today. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Che, uh, <laughs> Dick Jones. <laughs> Uh, we're running a bit short on time, uh, so let me uh, take prerogative of the moderator to uh, give the first question to Frank Verastro, who's uh, <laughs> my boss. Tanaka-san, thank you very much, and Fatih and Ambassador Jones. Uh, we very much appreciate having you here. Um, one of the things that we did talk about, and, and I'm a little concerned, uh, uh, presentation, you focused on the policy case, the new policy case. The history of the IEA has been the reference case, and when we compare it to things like the IEO that EIA puts out, I'm concerned that, that some people will look at this, and I, I know you believe that the reference case, um, I, want to, I don't, well, don't want to say it's irrelevant, but, but lacks relevance in certain ways. But it seems to me that, that some of the assumptions of the new policy case also kind of strain credibility. So where do you find the happy medium? And for the po people that, that use the IEA reports, to kind that's the baseline against which a lot of other analysis is measured. How do they discern what the, the reference case and the new policy case and the current policy case, what they really mean? Yes, Frank, thank you very much. That is one of the basic uh, let's say point and this world energy to uh, make a difference from the other uh, from the previous ones we put uh, lots of our energy in uh, explaining about this new policy scenario because we have been criticized by this current policy or, or reference scenario because that, that is not really happening uh, the government is taking um, actions anyway, uh, even though it's not yet uh, planned or budgeted as such. But uh, energy efficiency sectors, renewable energy or low carbon technologies, government will take some action. And uh, definitely the oil demand will not go up to 117, 15 million barrels per day. It's impossible. So. So, so we try to make it as realistic as possible. But as you say, we assumed uh, the parameters of new policy scenario some time ago, and uh, actual development in the different countries, in, including the United States, uh, certainly makes our new policy scenarios a little uh, less updated. So we will continue to update these elements or parameters of new policy scenario to make more realistic. We are not making a projection for the future. This is the scenario analysis. What if this scenario comes to reality, the cost for that, investment, technologies, or government policy necessary to achieve this scenario? So we try to show the range of what should happen in the future between new policy scenario and 450. And we say 450 is a very sustainable scenario. Of course, it's difficult. And new policy is p probably more or less happening. So the answer should be between these two scenarios. And what the cost for that? That is our basic idea. So don't think it's a projection. It's rather, in case, I mean, in our analysis, it's more the back casting. If two de degrees Celsius happens, what is necessary? If the current policies or actions will lead us to this. What is the implication for that? So do you have anything to add? Yeah. Well, in the interest of time, let's um, try to group several questions together and then ask our guests to uh, answer them uh, collectively. So uh, let's take one from each section, and then, then we'll ask for the answer. Charlie Ebinger from uh, Brookings Institution. Thank you, Guy. I was wondering, uh, with the changes you see occurring in the uh, European gas market, what do you see as the ramifications on Russian development of some of their more costly gas up in the high Arctic? Okay, we'll take one from here. Uh, well, I think in the back had a, your hand up first. The microphone, uh, Grant, uh, or uh, yeah, Gary. 
You should state your name. And Hi, uh, Brian Maxwell from the Cato Institute. You, you talked a lot about shale gas um, and how that's changed the market for natural gas. There seems to be a trend now that there's actually a, in, in America to a shift to liquids and uh, shifting the horizontal drilling, shifting to oil, which could also radically change the eager for, eager for shale in Texas, for instance, uh, could potentially change uh, the oil market just like the shale gas did to the natural gas market. Do you have a comment on that? Okay, thank you. Is there is there anyone on this? In this be equal. So we had uh, Brookings and Cato, so maybe somebody. Uh, <laughs> Molly, Molly Williamson, Middle East Institute. Thank you. Uh, what happens in your analysis if nothing happens? Just on a hunch that the United States, along with other countries, uh, does not take. Uh, some of the efforts to produce, say, clean energy legislation or the like, uh, hypothetically speaking. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I think that's a good set of questions to start with. Uh. So, um, the, the, the cheap gas in Europe and uh, availability of a lot of uh, uh, gas in the markets make in general the gas producers worried and i see two trends which may be more or less uh, linked to each other one on the investment side the other one on the political side on the investment side uh, the uh, appetite for uh, new investments especially the costly investments as you have mentioned is uh, fading away and one may see a lot of delays as a result of uh, uncertainty of the need of substantial gas uh, production coming to the markets, which in turn is that a good news. Uh, as uh, Ambassador John said, as the, as the dogs, we bark. We again bark because we think that if the, when the gas glut finishes, the, to make an investment at that time, uh, we have very little time, a typical gas uh, field, you need uh, six, seven years in optimistic terms uh, to develop. So the uh, fading away of uh, this investment for the uh, uh, green fields is not good, especially the ones and the costly ones. I think we will see some delays uh, uh, there. The second implication on the gas uh, pr uh, producer exporters is uh, the coming together and building a gas exporting uh, countries forum and to make some steps in that direction. We are following that, uh, those developments uh, closely. We are uh, happy if that uh, organization brings information, discussion, transparency in the markets. But uh, I think today everything is going very well for the gas producers. Uh, uh, so I hope uh, nobody will uh, uh, take steps in order to uh, give wrong signals to the gas market developments in the next years uh, to come. The, uh, I think the, in the gas markets, the main uh, issue, the oversupply is not only because of shale gas, but at the same time, uh, lots of LNG is coming. The amount of LNG between 2010 and 2013, the capacity growth, new LNG is about 50%. So whatever we built in the last 40 years, we are going to increase this by 50% only in the next three years. So let's don't forget the, uh, the LNG part uh, of it. And for the uh, U.S., we expect that the U.S. Uh, production can easily grow about five, six dollar MB2 uh, terms in real terms in the next 20 years, and the U.S. will not need to import uh, gas, even though there may be switches from gas to oil and again back from oil, oil to gas, depending on the gas oil price uh, uh, differentials. But on top of that, I would like to highlight one thing that I didn't mention much uh, a lot. When we say unconventional oil, we shouldn't only fix to the uh, shale gas. Uh, one could see some surprises from Asia in terms of coal bed methane, especially in, in, in China and in Australia, some uh, uh, growth uh, one may uh, see in those uh, countries on top of the uh, shale gas. What happens if nothing happens? then this is exactly the question coming uh, from Frank. This is our uh, uh, reference scenario, we call it, or the, we call it current policy scenarios and our IEA 
uh, EIA colleagues say uh, their uh, reference case, no policy change. If no policy change as of 2010, continues 25 years of time, we will have a temperature increase about six degrees Celsius. We are heading to that. And there is no uh, doubt about it. This is a, a definitely a catastrophic uh, way. And I am more hopeful uh, than previous years that something will happen. But this something uh, is not the thing that we would like to see. Uh, it is the reason. Uh, just to uh, address what, uh, uh, at what Mr. Tanaka said, we, we have up to now a policy scenario which we call what happens if nothing happens. We all know that something will happen. It cannot go, it cannot go this, and we see the governments are putting some new efforts there. On the other hand, we had a scenario which we called 450, we, uh, we presented today. It doesn't seem, as we stand now, are the most likely case. So governments and the industry ask us, can you make us, uh, another baseline between the what happens if nothing uh, happens and the what happens if you go to 450? These are both seems to be not the most likely cases. So we developed another scenario, as Mr. Tanaka said, we call the new policy scenario, which takes into account the likely new policies coming from the governments, not as aggressive as the 450, but also not just the time stops, like in the reference scenario. But finishing that uh, question, if nothing happens, this is really the worst thing that we can see, uh, climate change and lots of troubles in the oil markets as well. There. And just to add a, a briefly to what uh, Fatih's just said, I mean, one of the virtues of, of the new policy scenario is to keep governments from becoming complacent. Because it's not only just what happens if nothing happens, but what happens if we actually do achieve what people have pledged, and it's not enough? So that's what we have to keep in mind. We not only have to do more than nothing, we have to do more than what they've pledged already. Yeah, good point. Um, it was, I think there was one question here that, uh, and then uh, you'll, be, you'll be next. Yes, thank you. My name is Kevin Nakuba. I have basically um, three questions to Dr. Uh, Birol. Uh, one is, as a third person that is uh, not completely in the gas world, could you give a specific definition what conventional gas, unconventional gas, and natural gas exactly is, and where these are geographically concentrated at the global level? And the second question is basically to add on the discussion about the baseline scenario and what happens if nothing happens. Um, wouldn't it be... Um, uh, necessary to do next to an uh, economic analysis of ha what happens if uh, we don't uh, reach the 450. So really coming to a uh, dollar sign to also balance the, the fact of how much you will have to invest to achieve the 450. And then the third question is why is hydrogen not mentioned in the overall long-term outlook? Thank you. Okay, we can take one more uh, over here. Michael Ratner with Congressional Research Service. How did you factor in, um, you, you kind of in an early slide alluded to uh, the delinking of oil and gas. Um, how do you factor that into looking at future gas supplies if there is a delinking in the next couple of years? If we can, since there are four there, we can. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, the both in oil sector and in the gas sector, the what is conventional, what is unconventional, it is becoming less and less uh, uh, clear where is the distinction uh, point. But uh, how we do it in the gas is that more the extraction technologies. Uh, the, we use more unconventional uh, technologies uh, to extract the shale gas or the different uh, coal bed methane and others compared to the conventional gas. It's the, the technology that you use, that, that you employ. Where they are concentrated, uh, this is uh, the big countries are here, uh, Russia, I mean Russia, uh, Iran, and Qatar, they, these three make about 50%, uh, half of the global uh, gas uh, reserves, in fact, uh, when you look at it, and followed by other uh, Middle East countries and uh, North American uh, countries. The economic analysis of what happens if we don't reach the 450. We have uh, 
Uh, there are many implications of that in terms of economy, in terms of demography, in terms of climate, uh, and so on. But we are uh, not the organization that look after those issues. We are more looking at the energy uh, uh, sector. Uh, what, what we know is that uh, from the studies uh, which were carried out, uh, a few uh, percentage points of the GDP equivalent uh, money is needed to adapt to the uh, implications to address the implications of the uh, climate change, the temperature increase. So the one recent study says 6% of the uh, GDP, but this is not our number, this is a number that is uh, uh, made by uh, others. But you don't need to be a scientist to know uh, that such a 6 degrees temperature increase will have substantial, uh, not only economic, but also demographic and immigration uh, and demographic implications. Uh, hydrogen, yes, we didn't mention hydrogen. In fact, we didn't mention many things, to be honest with you. The book is, was somewhere here, 700 pages. So we talk about, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, 45 minutes or so. Therefore, hydrogen is there. But it is, uh, hydrogen is, we think, is a, uh, uh, is a, uh, a technology. It may be difficult to see a major penetration of the hydrogen in the time frame we are looking uh, into, which is the next uh, 25 years. But in terms of fuel cells, uh, we may see, especially in the transportation sector, uh, more and more uh, uh, use. Future of uh, gas uh, uh, supplies in the context of uh, new uh, gas to oil uh, the new gas contracts, if they are uh, decoupled from uh, oil prices. First of all, I do believe that we will still need long-term contracts. I think we should distinguish two things. One, to have long-term contracts in a flexible way and not to need long-term contracts. I believe we need still long-term gas contracts, but what I believe is they should be uh, reflecting the realities of the market much better than uh, they are today. The, the, as we all, all know, why they were indexed to oil prices in the past, because one of the main reasons is that they were uh, substituting each other. Now, the substitution effect is more or less gone. Now, gas, gas and oil, they are uh, delivering uh, energy for different uh, uh, sectors. And uh, uh, therefore, Yes, for the long-term uh, contracts, because you need huge investments, uh, and in most cases, uh, uh, huge transportation uh, pipelines and others, which need some uh, type of insurance. And, uh, but they should reflect the market realities. And of course, in addition to long-term contracts, we would like to see more and more markets, uh, gas to sold, uh, sell, sold as a commodity in the, in the markets. Well, thank you very much. And I'm afraid that's going to have to be all given our guests' uh, schedule today. So thank you all for coming. And please join me in thanking you. <laughs>